צהריים טובים, שלום לכל מי שהגיע. אנחנו רוצים לפתוח את הפאנל בנושא השתלטות המוזיקת ה-EDM על תעשיית המוזיקה העולמית. אני אשמח להעביר את המיקרופון לכל אחד מהאורחים שלי שיציג את עצמו כאן. בבקשה. היי, בוקר טוב. אני רונן מיילי, בעלים של החתול והכלב, חברת הפקות דבש הפקות, מסיבות הרחוב של תל אביב. ועוד כמה דברים, מסיבות חוף, הרצליה וכולי, פסטיבלים גדולים. יושב ראש איגוד הברם והמועדונים בישראל, מקדמים חקיקה, פרלמנט וכולי. Apologies, I'll be the only one probably speaking mostly in English. Um, I'm Simon Clarkson from uh, WME, which is an uh, entertainment agency. I'm mostly responsible for booking music artists, uh, worldwide touring, um, now based out of uh, Los Angeles. Alan Gidreifus, today I'm the manager of Red Access. Thank you. אני רוצה להתנצל על כך שעמית דובדבני מאינפקטד משהו, הוא לא יצטרך להגיע אלינו בגלל עניין אישי, אבל כולנו נוכל לראות אותו לפחות בהופעה ביום חמישי בלייב פארק על הבמה. This questionnaires will be done simultaneously both in English and in Hebrew, most of the English will be directed to you. אני רוצה להתחיל בעצם בהצגה של נושאים, בסוף יהיה זמן, יהיה כרבע שעה שבהם תוכלו לשאול שאלות את האורחים. בואו בעצם נתחיל בנושא הראשון. הפריצה הישראלית לשווקים הבינלאומיים, בעצם כבר שנים שאומנים כמו אינפקטד משרום, אסטריקס, בורגור ועוד רבים ממשיכים לפרוץ לתוך הסצנה האלקטרונית, מגיעים לפסטיבלים הגדולים, לרייבים הגדולים, לאירועים החשובים, מחזיקים עדות מעריצים שזה אין לתאר. הייתי רוצה לשאול אתכם בעצם, איך אתם רואים את המגמה הזאת מהעיניים הישראליות מכאן, של אומנים שבעצם עולים על מטוסים ומצליחים לכבוש יותר ויותר ויותר את הפלחי שוק הבינלאומיים? גי, אתה מנהל הרכב שנקרא Red Access, שנוחל הצלחה ממש מסקרנת בשווקים הבינלאומיים. אם זה פרימוורה ופסטיבלים כמו סונאר, בעצם יש פה מגמה כבר של הרכבים אה, אה, ישראלים, זה כבר לא רק אינפקטד אה, עושים את זה, או סקאזי עושה את זה, או בורגור, זה כבר נהיה מתווה מאוד מאוד ארוך של אומנים אה, שמצליחים בשווקים הבינלאומיים. אה, אוקיי, בגדול כל הגלובליזציה ו... שקורית ושקרתה בשנים האחרונות, אה, בעיניי עשתה את זה כי היום כבר אין ממש משמעות מאיפה אתה מגיע, כלומר אתה יכול להגיע מכל מדינה ולהצליח, פשוט זה תלוי עד כמה אתה טוב ועד כמה אתה משקיע ועד כמה אתה בעצם יוצר איזה משהו מעניין ומיוחד וכל אחד יכול לעשות את זה מכל מקום. אז עניין הלוקיישן והמיקום, אפילו איפה הם גרים, פעם אמרו שברגע שאתה מצליח אתה צריך לעבור לברלין או LA או לונדון, זה גם כבר לא בהכרח ככה, אפשר לגור פה ולהופיע בכל העולם כל סוף שבוע ואין מניעה כאילו. Simon, I'm going to direct this one for you. Um, from the eyes of the Israelis, the perspective of seeing our uh, local heroes uh, succeeding in the international markets, like artists like Infected Mushroom or Borger are reaching a, a stardom status by performing in the major festivals and larger events. Uh, we clearly see uh, uh, something which is uh, being more and more a routine of Israeli artists. talent succeeding in international markets, and not necessarily just psy-trans gods, but uh, nowadays EDM heroes. Um, how do you see this uh, uh, translating to the uh, worldwide markets? I, th I think it's difficult because sometimes the worldwide market, as you put it, doesn't necessarily see itself um, as a segregated worldwide market that cares about um, the origin of the artist a lot of the time. I think that the identity usually comes from the domestic market, and you can always see various domestic markets being stronger sometimes with talent coming through. So I think for a long time um, there would be uh, a real pride in you know, the Dutch domestic market where a lot of artists would come through, uh, especially in the electronic world, and in Germany, in the UK. I think um, for us, looking at it from a global perspective, we see domestic markets getting stronger with the sort of 
um, the strength of the, the, the market itself. I think that Australia is a really good example of that now, and I think that that's probably um, where the Israeli market will trend towards over the next 10 years, I would have said, because what happened in Australia was that the major festivals started failing, uh, and they were predominantly and heavily relying on international talent. And what they hadn't really figured out was that the, the domestic music market itself was really, really strong. And they could actually pretty much program their festivals with 60 or 70% domestic talent and still sell out the festival. And now what we see in, in that country, in that market, is that the major international festivals have fallen. Uh, there's three that have gone out of business in the last two years. But actually, the winner and the beneficiary of that are the boutique festivals with the native talent and the domestic talent, which is 90% predominant throughout. And sometimes festival promoters will always be tempted just to add that extra international artist to make it feel like the overall offering for the ticket prices is, is worthwhile. I feel like the more you can grow your market um, within the domestic community and young talent can come through, the better it's going to be and that will then export to international markets. Interesting, thank you very much. מיילי, איך אתה רואה את זה בתור אחד שבעצם מייבא על בסיס שבועי די-ג'יי מכל העולם לישראל? איך אתה רואה את זה הפוך? So, first of all, I apologize, it's gonna be in Hebrew. It's my better side. בסופו של דבר אנחנו אנשי עסקים. יש לנו תקציב שאנחנו צריכים להתאים לו בטבלה כמה עולה הלוקיישן, כמה עולה הדי-ג'יי, כמה עולים כל המסביב, ויוצרים איזושהי היתכנות כלכלית. אני מרגיש שבישראל, ספציפית בתל אביב, אנחנו מתחילים לייצר תוצרת מקומית חזקה של אמנים ו- ו- <coughs> ומוזיקה, והרבה נובע בגלל הצורך, או בגלל ה... יותר נכון, בגלל הדרישות הגבוהות, או ההתמסחרות של אמנים, של אמנים גדולים בעולם, והניסיון כביכול של סוכנויות להוציא, או, או בעצם... אה, אה, לגייס יותר כסף עבור האמן. כי בסופו של דבר לאותו אמן שיש נחשק, יש 300 תוצאות, והוא צריך לדעת לאן הוא הולך, איפה הוא מקבל את הביד הכי טוב, איפה זה מסתדר לו בערוץ שלו, בדרך לאיזה מדינה, והלוואי שזה יסתדר. בשנים עברו היינו אומרים, אה, זה אנטי ישראלי, הם לא אוהבים את הישראלים, הם לא אוהבים פה, אבל חבר'ה, תראו, בסופו של דבר... לדוגמה יום עצמאות, סלומון צריך להגיע מהמבורג לישראל, לנסוע לדובאי דרך ירדן או קפריסין, משם לנסוע חזרה לציריך, הוא לא רוצה לנסוע כל כך הרבה שעות, זה לא מתאים לו, זה לא בא לו, הוא לא אנטי ישראלי, הם אוהבים אותנו, הם מתים לבוא לפה, אבל בסופו של דבר נורא קשה להביא את האמנים האלה, ומה שקרה עכשיו בתל אביב, לפחות בבועה שלנו, קרה איזשהו משהו הפוך, בטח גי יודע, זה כבר לא מגניב להביא די-ג'י מחו"ל, כולם מביאים. Everybody gets uh, a bro DJ, זה uh, small one, big one, familiar, not familiar. It's very hard for someone from outside to know exactly what is the, what is the popularity of each, uh, each uh, DJ. So what they are doing, they are going for the Facebook and see how many likes they have this artist and say, ah, this guy is familiar. But it's not really, it's not the content, it's not the story. And this is why we try to get the DJs who have the story. who's been something, been, been there, did that, they have, they have story behind them. And, the, Tel Aviv, and the, Tel, the Israeli crowd is not stupid. He know exactly what he want. And we make like, uh, I see Oren Crystal over here in the crowd. And uh, we become a nation of psytrance to techno and house, house a nation. I believe everybody see it, all the, all the academic uh, uh, scholarship going for the, Uh, for the house and techno music, the psytrance maybe is not in, in a low situation, but uh, you, you can see we are giving more of an uh, impact from Guy Gerber, Guy J, Guy Mansour, uh, and some others which are really having a good time in the global uh, scene and playing major parties and have a line in Ibiza in major clubs and beach house and everything. Uh, and like uh, Guy said, the, glo- the globalization Did I say it right? Yeah. <laughs> the globalization is the, doesn't give a shit where you come from. You just need the correct product and the right time. And the, and the borders between the genres is coming and, and getting faded. Because when I say now EDM or techno and house and progressive and minimal, even me, I don't know what I'm, what I'm booking anymore, you know? It's all big genres, but... 
We have like a dictionary, it's called Bitport. Bitport say it's all by genres. What I did, that, what I remember when I was young, that say techno, progressive, it's not what it's written over there, you know? It's definitely totally different genres. So now the new age, like the 21, 22, 23 years old, they start to educate it by the electron music, by the dictionaries, by the tools they have to know, to know the, the step ahead. And the part of this culture, what's happened here, it's uh, very important for uh, our culture because here I can see some people here who is creating music and it's important for us that these people will keep and doing it and give us a good name outside the, of Israel because it's coming back to us when we try to book people like Simon and some others. This is the relation between, between people and not between countries. Half in English, half in English. <laughs> I mix it up. I mix it up. Good one. <laughs> והוא זה שאמר שהוא לא ידבר באנגלית, רק שתבינו. <laughs> זה פה. Um, moving on. Um, next subject. Uh, and I'm directing this to you, Simon. Um, the EDM is nowadays pop. There's no question about it. This is, this is nowadays new pop. And the new kings of pop are already taken over the charts, the airplays, and, and the crowd seems to vote by the foot by showing up into major festivals. Uh, is it truly the reign of the EDM as the new pop for the coming few years? I'd, I'd probably argue um, against the categorization, but I'd actually agree with exactly what you're saying. I think that the, the, the sort of self-imposed boundaries that we used to have via things like Beatport that would categorize music no longer exist to the same extent that it used to. And I think that's down to a, a number of things. I think, first of all, the people that are truly um, the, the, the kings, as you put it, are the guys that 20 years ago were just really well thought of producers of big rock bands, let's say. So the producers weren't famous. The producers were people that earned the most money from making the record. They were the people that would be turned to by any major label to make a huge successful album for a rock act or whatever, or a pop act or whatever it was. But they weren't the name people. What we've got now is the producers are performing. So if you look at uh, uh, Calvin Harris or a Tiesta, David Guetta, whoever it might be, these are the guys that are being turned to first and foremost because they're music producers and they're hit makers. But they now have a parallel career. They have a parallel career in performing um, predominantly their own music and, and those two things go hand in hand, chart success and what they're doing. And the format is the most important part. Electronic music provides a format which basically means that the producer can go up on stage and not have to play an instrument. They can go up on stage, command an audience, sell thousands of tickets for people to come and see a performance because the accepted norm now is not that we have to see a five-piece band on stage to warrant that it's a performance that we will go and pay a ticket for. So I think that the categorization is something that has been broken down and I also think now that, again, the genres become less and less relevant, if you like. It's all electronic music. And I don't think they've just arrived. I think they've been there for the last 10 or 15 years. I think if you look at any nation's national chart, you will have had a lot of those guys that we still look at today who are predominant in those charts. And just as much as the large rock acts or the large pop acts, it's just more character-based, if you like, with comparing a, a Justin Bieber to a, to a Calvin Harris. And they're performers of different kinds. Um, and I think the second part is that now we live in a world of very smart collaborators. The people that are the true stars are the collaborators. You've got Skrillex writing most of the Justin Bieber record that's been a huge success. You've got Diplo producing multiple, multiple platinum-based artists, Ariana Grande, whoever you want to name. It's the producers who've become successful and it's the collaborators that are spreading you know, the, the sort of good word, if you like, globally. Interesting, it's like Rick Rubin 20 years ago simply didn't step out of the uh, production Rick, room. Absolutely, if Rick Rubin had put together a show and he DJ'd and done block parties and everything else, he'd probably have had an entire career at the side, whether he wanted it or not. He probably didn't, otherwise he probably would have done it. He's a pretty smart guy. So it's as if the EDM era in the last decade is, is simply uh, uh, the shift from the being the anonymous producer in the studio and just being at the front. I think it's more about what we accept, as I said, what we accept to be um, a performance. 
you know, we, we would now buy a ticket just as easily to a pop act that we would a DJ performing like an infected mushroom holds a concert of that size because people don't have um, a predetermined idea of what they want to see on the stage and what they, you know, some of the shows that we're seeing now that are much bigger productions than anything that a comedian or a rock band, you know, we've been for years looking at a five piece rock band on a stage. Maybe you've got a light show, but other than that, that's it. If you go to any of the major shows now, you know, uh, for electronic producers, you're going to be watching something that's been put together content-wise, both visually and audio-visual. Um, and it's, you know, it's impressive and it's probably pushed the game up another level for all the other acts in the pop world as well. But something has changed. Um, the, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, used to make music and they sell your music and actually earn money from selling the music. True. Back in the days, today, something happened with the agency and labels, which the music, the money won't come from the music, it will come from the shows. But it didn't change from the... Is it, it, is it true, change. yes? yes like but, you sell much but less it's music? Right, but it's, it's distribution. That's it. We didn't change it, the agents didn't change it, the managers didn't change it, the artists didn't change it, the fan changed it. Yeah, yeah. The way in which content is distributed now means that live performance becomes a, a much bigger thing than it used to, and therefore, yes, the live performance and live touring side has more of an influence on the scene as a whole because that's where we consume our content more. The performance is more the predominant thing where we will dis we will download or stream the music and we become fans and then we want to go and see the performance. The thing is that uh, 10 years ago you couldn't, if I was, uh, I don't know, 15 years old, I didn't have enough money to buy all records and now when everything sure. is free I can choose whatever I want, whatever I like and then I go and approach ticket for this specially, yeah. special event. Yeah. So basically it's come from the crowd and from technology yeah. but the result is that the artist I don't know about the labels, but the artists and management get their, uh, their profit actually from the shows themselves. And the show themselves, they ha the amount or the fee of the ticket, actually the crowd will pay it, okay? Back, it, back to him. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Also, I think uh, because uh, years ago you could have had a career as a DJ only being a DJ yeah. and uh, today it's not possible anymore you have to be like a producer and that was also a big change in the world industry that many DJs became producers such as Guetta and people like that uh, which started as DJs and they were used to perform so these are actually performers that took the producer chair and then went back into performing because I guess this is their passion um, not like Rick Rubin, which will uh, never go on a stage uh, or something like that. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm now afraid of showing my age, but um, <laughs> the the tradition uh, went a lot deeper than that. And, and actually, um, if you look back to the late 80s and the early 90s, you would have someone like Junior Vasquez, who had a residency uh, in New York at Paradise Factory and at Vinyl. And the world was, at that point, in that scene, was ruled by the DJs. And you're absolutely right. Then the DJs got invited to produce a record or come and collaborate with a record. And, and so it, and also you're right, also because um, many years ago, it was just about the DJ and it was about the event and what happened at the event, which I think it's coming back around to now, actually. God is a DJ, isn't it? Uh, apparently, Used yeah. To be. One he, of, he's one a producer now. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> think, about, think about this artist that don't have the, quali the qualities to, to perform in front of people sure. and they are doing killer music, but they kill their career because they don't know how to perform. They stand like this, you know, like really in the... They have a name. Really but, low but they depression. have a name. Ghost producer. Yeah, no, but God, that is a standard no, the producer, li listen, this is a new thing. I don't know, the ghost producer, I don't know if everybody knows this, but they are producers who make music for other fake DJs sure. who is telling their, their music and they get in shows. It's, it's crazy, man. It's true, but I actually think that what we're dealing with now is, is more that the, um, the platform and the format of DJing allows people that didn't have 
the, um, the wherewithal or the personality to come out and perform a show. And so therefore, that gives them some safety to sort of hide behind turntables. It's like a born star, you know, yeah. like Chav Nolad in Israel. <laughs> you know, he's going to show nice, and the music, we walk on it, and we dressed him nice. Yeah, this is, I mean... Do you have styling, uh, uh, styling no. Uh, no, services? No, management in companies might okay. do, but not, does, not They do it? Maybe. That's that's uh, my area. <laughs> yeah, it's a good well, idea. That's though. a management thing for sure. Well, not surprisingly, this conversation leads uh, to another hot subject. Basically, the uh, all the electronic DJs and producers nowadays, they are being seen as as half gods. I mean, they travel with their own jets. They've got an entourage of 12 people, which. Mostly, I need to pay for at the end of the day. They're asking for sh- Nike shoes. Every show they come for three, Steve, four people. Steve, you know Ayoki, about Steve Aoki is right there, fresh new underwear. Yeah. Just, and we can just go on like hours and, and bore everybody it, to death. Someone but else pay for the, it. The, whole, the whole thing is that the, nowadays uh, electronic heroes are, are, are being looked as half gods by the audience and the media. Um, they've got so ridiculous behind, this, behind the scenes uh, requests. Uh, that need to be accommodated. And I'm, I'm wondering, did Faithless really uh, 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 foresee the future by just writing a song, which is God is a DJ? I mean, that's, that's like 12, wait, year, 12 years this, back, and when it's this, now actually a stardom status. Right, but go back to rock and roll. When did this change? When was this ever different? It, Iron Maiden flew a world tour on their own 747 jet, piloted by the lead singer. Ed Force One. <laughs> 30 years ago. So how are we saying this is different to what it, we're looking at now? I think it was, tra- the rock it and was, roll it was traditional uh, 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 to see rock and roll as, as gods, right. rock and roll star. And it, I think it's relatively new that in the last decade only, we're starting to see underground, underground music uh, being uh, uh, popular. And, and coming out from the underground. Then we see uh, New Day's pop, which is the EDM, like David Guetta or Afrojack style or Armin van Buren. Mm. These people are traveling like the rock stars 20 years ago. Right. Um, yeah, I just, I don't see, I don't necessarily see a, see a difference because I don't categorize in just how we should see an electronic artist or how we should see a rock band or how we should see a... Michael Bublé or, or whoever, you know, these, these people, if, they, if they're stars, if, they're, if people want to listen to their music, if people want to buy their tickets, they're all, should be seen in exactly the same way. Like I say, this is no different to Alice Cooper, to, uh, you know, She's ACDC. She's coming here this hour. Right. So you, you can see this is just a progression of, it's just about, we categorize it because of the performance, because someone isn't necessarily up on stage singing or playing a guitar. We just maybe see it slightly differently. And then we see these guys. And, and the whole point is that the young kids that idolize um, a lot of these artists, they probably do that because 30 years ago, picking up a guitar in your bedroom was one thing. And now producing music on your laptop is a far more accessible thing to do. And therefore, every bedroom can conceivably can have a superstar waiting to happen in the bedroom. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I'm agreeing a, a lot with Simon. It's just um, music is changing all, of the, all the time and it depends how much tickets you sell and how much fans you have. And uh, many DJs have much more uh, fan base than a lot of rock stars. And if you make a million dollars a night, I guess you will have a private jet flying you around uh, from place to place. And yeah, it's, it doesn't matter. The genres don't matter. It's just um, um, getting used to having one or two people on stage doing the whole uh, performance than a band. But it's the same. If 10,000 people come to see you, then 10,000 people come to see you. You're a star. You're a rock and roll star. Like. All the big DJs are the biggest rock and roll stars today, for my opinion. Um, just in the matter of star, being a, a star and, um, yeah. To be honest, I don't agree with you because uh, we talk about a, a category which is modest, not modest, which is like equal, because this is where we come from, not the underground. We are all equal. The stage is not high. We are not giving riders about how many uh, uh, turbo jets of uh, you know smoke and lasers. You know there is riders like that. Yeah, that how many Tiesto, how many liters Tiesto of, 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 of jets? Yeah. You saw some. So 
what I'm talking about is about this, I don't know, even a Vichy. Okay, 25, how old is he? He's fucking rock star, you know, and, and this 25 years old. He's retiring. Yeah, yeah he's so already he ex-rock star. He has a show with these guys with this summer. As well. So it's a good promotion for them. <laughs> what I'm saying is, you know, how many things did he had, like he had in his life that he's 24 years old, he has the biggest production in the world, one what? of them, and he's earning millions. It's not about the millions, it's about... I don't know, Jeff Miles and some other uh, Sven Vat, you know, other papas of this scene, you know, where we all start from. This is where I start from. You are older than me, I believe. We talk about it. And <laughs> these people, you know, we, we come from this equal, equal look. We come from this uh, change we all wanted to do back in the days, to put the electronic music b uh, back in the spot. It, not back, to put it in the spot. We fight for this because the rock and roll and everything, uh, Shakira and everything was so big. Mm -hmm. And now when Shakira is off and the mainstream is EDM, you know, they are going forward and the underground, underground uh, artist, maybe they're going in that route, but for me, it's hard as a club owner and promoter to look at these people as rock stars. You know, we are human beings. But Tiesto is not underground. You have a big underground scene, but Tiesto and Avicii are not underground and they never were underground. I can underground. give you a list of underground uh, artists which go in jet planes, not even business, jet planes, and have a rider like killers. You know, and this is exactly the border. Everything starts to be faded because the difference uh, where the artists go and when the crowds go, is a big, the, the range, can I say the range is, is getting bigger. But the minute, the minute <coughs> you start worrying about <clears throat> what the artist is spending their money on. No, it, no, it, I don't care about no, the, I, I the, the just, it's, it's <laughs> If the point. I didn't pay it, the, you know, because you, I paid usually. Right, so. the, the concern should be as soon as they don't sell out the stadium, as soon as they don't sell out your club, as soon as they don't do that, you know, that's, that's when there's a problem. To me, it's up to them and their accountant what they want to spend the money on. I think the point about the rock star or the king, rock star, queen, whatever it would be, is, is yeah, that we, we've kind of moved into a place where the popularity of a lot of these big artists just means that they have replaced what we see as the traditional rock star. Yeah, but... For me, the concern is that the public discussion, like in the last few weeks, is the Maserati that Afrojack just bought in a million and a half dollars, and not what's happening with his new single. This is where things shifted, I think. That's, that's what's getting more and more attention, uh, uh, not just from us as, but, as industry professionals. But what but used to get the attention was Mariah Carey having dressing rooms repainted in white and only lilies in her dressing room and, and what candles Beyonce had in hers. I don't see it as relevant to the artist side. You, you know, yes, maybe some of them can get lost in um, you know, the, the, um, the benefits of, of a successful career, but there's very little we can do about that ourselves. We might relate to them less and less. The more Maseratis they buy, the more <laughs> jets they fly, and we might relate to them less and less. I think some of the, some of the people that I would hold up as being true um, you know, uh, legends or stars in, in my eyes as a fan would be probably still the ones that um, I have no idea how much money they earn or spend, but the music is the thing that comes first to them and to me. So. I don't know. I, I don't worry too much um, about their spending power. Also, I think it's, a, it's just a matter of the media, you know? Media wants to sell what people want to watch, and most people want to watch a nice Maserati, an Afrojack with Paris Hilton driving it, you know? They don't care about his latest beat, and if he bought uh, this kind of synth, you know, most people will just won't be interested. So there's one media look at at these people and they know that people are interested in knowing what's going on with their lives. Like you said, Afrojack, Dead Mouse, Tiesto, many people, they have many fans. So if he will buy something or will go out with a celebrity woman or something, they will be interested in that. Um, but it's not really interesting for the artists themselves. They will continue and do their music and produce their videos. So it's just uh, the outside look of the media on it. Thanks. Um, going back home to Israel, uh, being as a stronghold of raves for the last 20 years, underground, 
illegal ones and eventually turning into illegal a legal scene like anywhere mm. else um, is becoming in the last few years uh, uh, a regular place for artists touring from from underground DJs that visit clubs here to the major ones that visit the more larger raves. Um, and it seems that Israel is shaping into uh, uh, its own festival season. Um, is the crowd in Israel ready for the major events? I mean, if tomorrow and open sales and sell out 250,000 tickets within 15 minutes, is there something similar that we can foresee for the Israeli market? Is the Israelis ready for the major, major festival and not just the large raves? <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> No. <laughs> it's the biggest question ever. <laughs> because you dream all day about festival, to be the first one to do electronic festival and to invest. And then you know, to be honest, that uh, we can have an act error two weeks before, three weeks before. It's happened a year before, and two years before, and three years before. Last year I canceled Lana Del Rey show because of this situation. Everything. Yesterday we had a, don't worry, we had a bomb, we had a bomb in a bus. Not, you I'm come with right. me to the beach, don't I'm worry, I'm we're right. not going that way. <laughs> and this situation can blow a big, can blow everything. Mm. You go, you spend money, you, t you, you invest all your life actually, okay? And then something small, a 13 years old can stab a soldier and now we have a war in Israel. Mm. So it's... It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. So <laughs> I dream every day about this booking agency, which not everybody like Simon, which is, we all know that he's cool with you. And if something is canceled, he said, don't worry, we pass it together, which you need to have the strength and the will and, and the, the love to the one you work with to, to actually give up on money mm -hmm. because you can tell him, fuck off, give, bring over, yeah? And I don't know yet any agency that will go with me for this risk, that I can cancel the event uh, one day, two day, three day ago, and we start to have a conscience. Why? Because if something has happened, I feel not comfortable to put on Facebook and advertise because, I'm sorry to say it, my brothers are being killed, and, mm. and I put party, 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 and I, become, and I feel idiot. Sure. And I'm waiting for the peace, man. Will it come? Can you get us the piece, uh, Simon? I'm working. I'm working. Um, I think. I, <laughs> how do I follow that? That's the truth. Um, I, one thing I would say is um, a different perspective from my point of view, um, because I look at it as a sort of global situation always. Is you you should really appreciate because I do that you are one of the few countries that actually remains with a vibrant and healthy club scene, number one. You have permanent or semi-permanent venues still open and regularly open weekly. And from my perspective, in the last 10 years, all I've seen is clubs closing. Festivals that grew in countries meant that permanent venues closed. And I grew up in London, and um, I'm a Londoner, and I started at Illegal, illegal Raves, that was where I started in the mid-80s, <coughs> um, selling tickets. I was 15 years of age, and I was selling tickets to Illegal Raves um, in phone boxes, telephone boxes, because there were no mobile phones. And so what happened was we progressed from um, illegal gatherings and raves to legalized raves to warehouse parties to people investing money in permanent nightclubs. There was always nightclubs, but the nightclubs then turned into places like Cream and Home and what we referred to as super clubs. The only permanent clubs left in London from probably 20 that we had to choose from 10 years ago are two major permanent venues, Fabric and Ministry of Sound. Ministry of Sound will close, we believe, within the next two years um, because the land has been bought and who knows it'll, if it'll reopen. Fabric has been there. I think they've almost celebrated 20 years, and I remember the day it opened. But we don't have regular club nights. We don't have a regular club scene, underground or otherwise. What we have is a full summer of festivals, 
and we have the established ones and we have the ones that open every year and close the year after because they lost a lot of money. Um, and it's a, it's a really brutal industry. In Holland, I think we last time we actually knew the exact numbers, the summer contains almost 1,500 festivals just in one country in Holland, which is not a huge country, right? So from my perspective, where can you go for all of your artists with regular club nights? Very few countries. So I would hope that you can appreciate that for a start because it doesn't happen in many places. The progression of any scene then becomes, okay, we've got this amazing, vibrant domestic music scene. We would love to have our own festival. And exactly for the reasons you've just said, there are particular indigenous uh, situations that make it really difficult to put on a, a, a big live music event. Um, and and it, you know there are other countries with similar issues. I don't know what the answer is. I will say one thing as an anecdote. There has been a, a promoter who will go unnamed in Germany who has had the same party every summer, a series of parties every summer. Um, I think he does 10 shows. And the deal you do with him, and I hate it, is, but the artist will do it, is to say, okay, you're booked for um, August the 5th. If it rains, there's no show. I'm not paying a cancellation fee. I'm not paying. He I, loves it, he loves it. I, I'm, booking, I'm booking flights that are rebookable, and I will only book your hotel two days before when I've seen the weather report. I hate dealing with this show, but all of the artists make it happen because they love playing the show. It's an outdoor party. It has a legendary status that they all enjoy and they love going. And he, the promoter who shall remain nameless, knows I hate dealing with it because I see no business sense in it whatsoever. Right, my artist is committed to your date, but with no money unless it happens and if it doesn't rain. And then we argue about what is rain it, how hard is it raining? Can you really not have a show? Is your stage weather protected? Um, last year, I actually a friend, a colleague of mine was going to to Germany to meet him for a meeting, and I sent a, uh, a WME umbrella as a gift, um, as just a sort of joke Hint. between us. But I think that one thing is true: that where there's a will, there is a way. I think a lot of the artists that you work with and book regularly at the club um, would all at some point commit to something uh, where, let's say, it wasn't the standard um, booking procedure for a, for a major event. Um, Avi and I had a situation twice last year with two major artists where we had to reschedule and then cancel. Um, we had very similar situations in Turkey. Um, I think there is a way around it. I don't know what that way is, but I think we could figure it out, but the artist has to be willing and not just the agencies and the management. So. That, that's my so basically, you're telling me that if the cat and dog is open eight years, I have a kind of respect at the agency which I'm lasting so that long? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, but actually, you're looking, not you personally, mm -hmm. yeah. but basically, you're looking, the industry looking for the new bones, yeah, the new clubs that will last a few years more. I think you want the, you need the foundation of a healthy domestic scene. Yeah and clubs and regular promotions and and venues are the lifeblood of any major domestic scene. I understand, but it, I, I believe mm -hmm. that you guys, I'm sorry, yeah, but you guys <laughs> are playing a big role in our scene, every mm -hmm. scene in the world. Because let's give example, okay, we won't say names, but let's say there is two clubs in Tel Aviv. Really? And we both want the same artist. And you decide that this artist will go to the other club and not to this club. So actually, we are... I know you'd hate no, to, no, no, I know no. you'd hate funny, to think this. Funny, yeah, you just I know you'd hate to think this, no. but I'm, I'm no, no. a representative yeah. of my artist. Yeah. Okay, so there's management, and there's agents, and there's the artist. Exactly. So which role is playing who? The management, my the, boss, the my agency, the, the artist, because some artists, you can text them and yeah. say, you want a guy and say, yeah, talk to you really fast. Some artists, you have to go through, you know, like one month to... Oh, you should always talk to the agent. Yeah, I understand. But, but it's not us that makes the final decision. 
It's yeah. the artist that always makes the final decision. So it's his decision. I work for the artist. Yeah. Management ultimately works for the artist. So improve every gig he's played? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Okay. Every gig. And you know as well that you have very strong relationships with certain artists yeah. that will never be broken regardless of who the agent is or who the manager is. Right. Um, and we have to come into that and respect those relationships as well. As frustrating as it might be. I, you know, I've, I've had another of my artists who I've represented for over 12 years and he still will not, he refuses to, uh, to allow me to ask his major promoter in one particular country to, to raise his guaranteed fee from the last 10 years. Even though the guy drives a white Lamborghini. <laughs> That's the promoter, not the artist. Okay. So he's um, making money. I'm going to direct uh, one personal question to each one of you, and then we're going to go to the uh, okay. questions from the public. Um, Miley, uh, someone that holds uh, such a successful brand like the Cat and Dog for the eight years and associated with some of uh, Israel's largest productions, um, is there some kind of a focus for the Israeli scene and the Tel Aviv scene in particular? Anything that you see as the future in the next few years? It's a good question. To be honest, we are getting older all the time. And uh, us, in a personal way, no? Yeah. You live in LA now. You're not an English boy anymore, not a Londoner. <laughs> we have kids. We start to be scary persons, you know, from our, I believe, the older of us become scary with the ears, no? We, we start to get scary, you know? We are not fearless like we used to be. And the risk which we take is, uh, is getting smaller. And us, as the ones who's uh, promoting Tel Aviv, and I look Tel Aviv, and not only uh, in Israel, in the world, and get the major artists and bigger production, uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. And, uh, and worried as well. Because we, need, we needed a way that our scene will go forward. You know, I, I, want, I didn't see, I don't see right now, the way, uh, the way the scene is going in the next few years. What, sh what I know is that we look, which, what is the trend right now, okay, in the last two years and the next two years, and uh, today we have three, four stars, and next year will come three, four stars, different three, four stars. They will go one, two years more, but the scene change really, really, really quick. And it's really, from our point of view, it's really hard to plan plans for two and three years. And only some promoters here in Tel Aviv or Israel have the strength and the will and the vision to make a brand for a few years. What's happening, I don't know, Awakening and some other festival, it's running for a few years. It's become like a, a Mossad, Establish. like establishment. And for us, you know, the Israelis, because we live now, we live the, the moment, you know? Like I told you yesterday with the bar. We live the moment. And we don't plan so much in the next future, in the next two, three, four years. And this is what disappoints me, because we can't plan anything. You know, I want to put a brand up. I don't, want to, I don't care not to earn even one shekel for the, last, for the next four years, but after four years, I want to, to earn something. You know, I want to build it for 20 years. I want to get old. I want to be part of the scene even when I have grandchildren. But I know I can't, because everything changed fast, and our country, it's, it's our problem, not his problem. But it's all over the world the same. No, it's not. The yeah. things that happen now uh, uh, in Europe didn't stop their uh, plans. No, it's maybe they, they a little bit delayed, them, but it didn't uh, stop the plans. Like you say, I was in Holland. I'm going to <coughs> Holland many years. Thousands of festivals, thousands of parties, ADE, conference. You know, it's a, a real culture is banging there. But many are opening and many are closing. It's like these times are changing really fast. It's, I, I, it's but like it's you said in Australia, culture, many, you know? many huge festivals closed because Listen, it was Listen, ADE, ADE covered by national TV over there is part of the culture. The city is part of it. The guy who is selling flowers is part of it. You know, everybody is part of it. It's something that the, the country, the city, 
city hall, the, the, the population over there is, ha- is, is really hugging it and love But it. Also here you get huge Where parties about? in Tel Aviv for 200,000 people. 100,000, otherwise uh, some okay. costume. And <laughs> but yeah, it's But the same. Also here yeah. the city of Tel yeah, Aviv. Yeah, but really one year. One, one time a year, man. <laughs> one time a year. And one time we do it with headphones, which is really nice. You know, one time we do, we bang it and one time with headphones, like thousands of kids. Good. You know, so this is what, where the point I disappointed and where I'm happy about for next two years, next few years, because I see lots of Israeli music is coming and lots of Israeli artists are really ambitious to do it. And you can see two kids from Ashdod, which really bang it now and they know how to send to the correct people the music. And you can see the progress in the production and the connection they have. Because 10 years ago, it was about who you know, who you, sell the, who you give the music to. Yeah. You remember was a DJ is coming, Sasha or Digweed, yeah. and he used to give him a CD, you know, listen to my friend, you know? And this is why the music was sure. traveling, because there was this thing, unreleased music. Is still happening today? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. oh, but really small, like, no, the white the labels, like... All the big DJs play 50% unreleased stuff. No, If but you white labels, like vinyl, see, they're getting mm-hmm. vinyl. Mm-hmm. Ma- ah, much, much, much. Let's say... It's just on a USB stick. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's <a> white USB. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have to pay for other companies for using the... <laughs> so, I wish us a very good year with us. And uh, yeah. hope to get some discount in the next week. <laughs> Because now we're friends, you know, personal you friends. Was, there was an ending to this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I come to... This is Israel. Kiratono, actually. I think... No. I think... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I do 100 bookings a year, I, let's say I take half from you, you're the yeah, biggest we'll company. The, we'll the Owen Crystal can make club. me the measures, what's going on there. Uh, a question to you, Simon. Uh, sitting in William Moore's <laughs> offices, how do you spot actually the, the next star? I mean, somebody like Kaigo, a year back, was practically unknown. Yeah. And these days, he's getting the fees like stars. Yeah. Um, I think, <clears throat> going back to something we said earlier, the, the whole scene that we're involved in is, if nothing else, completely democratic in terms of a worldwide scene where a kid from a making music on a laptop in his bedroom in an unknown city in Norway, uh, you know, and that's happened more than once, um, can put his music up on SoundCloud, start to get followers, other followers tell other people to go listen. You know, it, it's become way more democratic now um, than it ever has been. And all it is for us is, and it is for the labels and it is for management, it is for everyone. Spotting talent just becomes... a challenge in a different way. You just have to have eyes on a lot of things, um, which, which I can't always. And so I have to have, I have to use the sort of power of quantity, if you like. So in the building that I sit in, there are, um, as a worldwide organization, we have over 120 agents in music. across many, many offices. Well, if you multiply those offices, the office I sit in in Beverly Hills, has over 1,500 people in the office. All, all parts of entertainment, film, music, TV, everything. We'll multiply that by the assistants, by all the young people who are interns, by all the... So we use a system where everyone puts, uploads music into one place and everyone then sort of democratically, they're part of the process to say, we love this, we hate this, we like, kind of like this, maybe we like this. And so our A&R process, if you like, is just to use all of those people as sets of eyes and ears to, to look at something which might pop. And, and ultimately it comes down to um, people making waves because other people have you know, um, discovered them. And so discovery is something that you need to sit on top of. And that, that's it for me, you just got to keep looking and be aware that other people will come to you with things. Like with Kygo, you know, it was an assistant that said, this kid's blowing up, you need to look at this. Okay, let's look at it. Wow, there's a lot of people listening. And that doesn't mean everything, but there's a lot of people listening. If there's a lot of people listening, you should listen. So we listen, oh, actually, yeah, this is going in a direction that a lot of people like. And then it's democratic from there because people vote with a click of a mouse and you know what you're looking at. And after that, other processes you know, labels and publishers and whatever else it might be, managers, they, they also make it happen. So we just have to be 
conscious and awake the whole time and looking and listening. That's it. Interesting. Guy, um, what are your aspirations and dreams as far as uh, an underground duo like Red Axis that are succeeding in the last uh, year or two internationally and seems to make more and more waves? I mean, they're now performing in, in festivals, but w where do they ultimately going to reach? Where do you see them? Um, well, first, I would like... Um, it's important for me and for them to keep their agenda as it is, no matter where they perform or if they get bigger or not, because they have an artistic and mu musical agenda. And that's very important to, to maintain even when you grow bigger, because um, uh, it's not about the hype, for my opinion. It's about the long-term long career. You have to think really about um, a, a larger spectrum. and. Um, it's all about, um, for, from one side, is to collaborate with the right people, if it is the right uh, vocalist or musicians or bands or re remixes. Um, and it's also getting more into the production, which is the same area, if they can produce uh, an album for a band or for uh, the singer. Um, film is definitely something that uh, is uh, very interesting, soundtracks and films. Um, and just evolve the whole time, have a new show every couple of years, have a new live show, um, getting bigger, better at their DJ sets uh, all the time. And just, um, yeah, keep on doing what they really like and um, don't be blinded by... Um, by money or opportunities and still keep your keep keep it real with yourself in general thank you very much toda ve avor le shalot ma kal akhsha mishu mashu sho said to assume that you were living in the uk late 80s early 90s right yes thanks for pointing out how old i am again <laughs> The all electronic music is seen as a flourishing, like the old, an orbital, an underworld, a prodigy, and, and now we're off the record, it's a personal question as a music club. How do you feel about the Americans, 25 years later, taking all of this very late to the game, uh, coming very late to the game, repackaging everything under sure. electronic dance music, EDM, yeah. like a generic name, like calling it rock, and like selling it, and now everybody is uh, overhyped in the States over it. And, uh, we know where it's at. Yeah, I, sometimes I get nostalgic and over um, protective of history like that and kind of say, how dare they, you know. But it, you can't have that attitude because this is art, you know, this is creative art. And the scene that came out of the late 80s, just as much you could say that New Yorkers you know, would be angry about people like Larry Levan and Chicago house music and all those, you know, because that's where we got it from. <clears throat> you know, um, I had friends that used to fly over to New York and Detroit and Chicago uh, in the early 90s. They would buy a ton of records and bring them back and sell them uh, in the UK, in London. And that's how our scene got started. And we had a big um, sort of watershed moment uh, in the UK with the Criminal Justice Act, um, which was basically to stop illegal raves. It got to a point where, you know, um, up and down the country there would be illegal raves every weekend. Farmers would get paid some money to borrow, to, you know, to rent a field and someone would put a sound system in it. But people started to get hurt, you know, major crowds of people without any kind of policing or uh, medical help or anything like that. You know, it started to get really out of hand. Don't get me wrong, the Criminal Justice Act was a complete aberration that should never have happened. But as the scene progressed, we got more organized, right? And so with, with the US, it's interesting because you can see exactly the same pattern emerging um, as it happened for us. And so it's the development of a scene and it's the development of a movement. And I'm okay with that. I, I think that... Yeah, sometimes you kind of go, but you guys, we, had, we did this first. Well, you know, you have to let go of that in a way because 
you, you know, you're in a moment, you're all a part of a movement or a scene in your own way, no matter what country you come from and how old you are. There's always something that you're involved in, hopefully, if you're passionate about the arts, if you're passionate about music, whatever it is, you will be part of a scene or a movement. Um, so the ownership of that is kind of secondary in a way. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. You just have to be okay with it and be comfortable with it because it's happening. It's funny, though, because now we're seeing the decline we're seeing the bubble bursting a little bit and those overinflated fees and all the rest of it, they're leveling out. If you look at Las Vegas, for example, that adopted the DJ four years ago and paid silly money and everything else, well, eventually the numbers didn't add up. You know, the kids that are going to these massive five-star hotels and resorts are not spending the kind of money that they spent, what the adults spend when they go and see Celine Dion or Britney Spears. So that's not gonna work out. Yeah, I'd lo I'm a Celine fan. Um, so it's, it's um, a progression, and it's also... There are peaks and troughs of those things, and we're now seeing the sort of slight decline. But it's different in every country. But I'm with you. I still feel like we did it first. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. Um, do you think that labels, like big labels, are less interested in, in younger people um, and give them less opportunities, like... Martin Garrix um, and like um, and for more older people like um, 25, 28 years old, so they give them less opportunities, but they like they could be like better. They think outside of the box, and they not set their mind on just one genre and could just um, mix several things. Um, I can, I guess I can answer part of that. Um, I think you have to, <clears throat> major labels have a big problem right now. These are institutions and organizations and businesses that were set up many, many years ago, um, post the Second World War. They had their peak when buying a record actually made you money. The secret to that was they would charge the artist for making the record, making the packaging, making all of those things that, you know, the artist got very, very little actually as a percentage of that final piece of the, of the pie, let's say. Now, we, for me, we're at the biggest point of content, distribution. I keep coming back to democracy, but it is a democracy because you don't need, as a young artist, you don't need the major label. If you're going to be a success, the major label will need you. To put up a record on SoundCloud or to put up music on SoundCloud or Spotify, where, wherever it's going to be, you can do a deal by yourself without a manager to add your music to Spotify, to add your music to iTunes, to put your music on any one of, on YouTube, whatever it might be. Distribution is entirely an open book now. So for me, the major label has more of a problem than you do. The major label needs to find you on any of those content distribution platforms to make money from you as an artist. So they do have to think more outside the box, as you put it, but they have to do that for the survival of the major label. Um, a major label is no longer a place which will necessarily be able to invest money in a young artist and develop them like they used to. The development happens outside of the major label now and the major label are further down the stream of development of those artists because they come in, let's say, at a point where there is already popularity, there is already an audience for that artist. So I think it's definitely changed, but to the benefit of the artist, honestly. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you.